Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Tuesday, November 19th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today, Russia reiterates warning on long-range strikes. So in response to reports of President Biden authorizing long-range Ukrainian strikes inside Russia with U.S. missiles, the Kremlin pointed to a warning previously made by Russian President Vladimir Putin. In September, Putin was asked about the possibility of NATO supporting long-range strikes on Russian territory and said it would mean the U.S. and European NATO countries were at war with Russia. He added, quote, if that's the case... Then, taking into account the change of nature of the conflict, we will take the appropriate decisions based on the threats that we will face, end quote. And I mentioned this yesterday in the initial story on Biden authorizing these long-range strikes. I just think it's important that to really stress what a big escalation this is, what a big provocation this is uh, from the view of Russia Um, And so the New York Times and several media outlets reported that Biden gave the green light for the attack of missiles to be used in strikes in Russia. And the attack have a range of up to 190 miles. So um, these reports, the, the reports of Biden authorizing these strikes, they have not been officially confirmed by the U.S. or Ukraine. But Zelensky in his nightly address on Sunday hinted that the strikes are going to start happening soon. He said, quote, today, there's a lot of talk in the media about us receiving permission for respective actions, but strikes are not carried out with words. Such things are not announced. Missiles will speak for themselves. They certainly will, end quote. In his response on Monday, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that if the reports are true, it would mean a, quote, qualitatively new round of escalation of tensions and a qualitatively new situation in terms of the involvement of the United States in the conflict, end quote. In other comments, Peskov said the escalation means more Western involvement in the war because, quote, targeting and other maintenance is not done by Ukrainian servicemen. It is done by military specialists from these very Western countries, end quote. So there's been other reports that have said the UK and France are going to let Ukraine use the Storm Shadow and Scout missiles in strikes on Russian territory. And um, earlier this year, there was a German military leak that revealed the British soldiers are on the ground in Ukraine helping fire the Storm Shadow missiles. So again, this shows how directly involved the US and NATO will be in these strikes, long range strikes in Russia. Um, it's direct U.S. and NATO support for that. So it is a uh, a big deal. Again, uh, not to be too redundant here, but this is just such a big escalation um, that that is that appears to be happening now this week. Uh, all right, the next one here: Hungary and Slovakia slam U.S. decision on long-range strikes in Russia. So Hungary and Slovakia, two NATO countries, have slammed President Biden's reported decision to support long-range Ukrainian strikes on Russian territory, an escalatory step that risks nuclear war. Another thing, I know I mentioned this yesterday too, in response to the talk of NATO supporting these long-range strikes a couple months ago, Putin ordered changes to the Russian nuclear doctrine. Again, really showing what this means to Russia, really setting a red line, but that red line is being uh, disregarded. So Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fitzo said, quote, this is an unprecedented escalation of tensions, a decision that thwarts hopes for the start of any peace talks and an end to the mutual killing of Slavs in Ukraine. Those who support President Biden's decision are in favor of the start of World War III, end quote. So pretty strong words there from Fitzo, who, since he came into office last year, he ended Slovakia's military aid for Ukraine. He's been calling for an end to this war since since he became prime minister about a year ago. Um, and then Hungary's foreign minister, Peter Cesarto, strongly criticized Biden's decision. He said, quote, The pro-war mainstream has launched its last desperate attack on the new reality. 
These forces seem to have no qualms about the worst case scenario, escalating the war in Ukraine to a global scale. End quote. And then he also took aim at pro war politicians in Washington and in Europe, saying, quote, One has the feeling that pro war political elites on both sides of the ocean are launching one last desperate, scalding attack on the new realities and the will of the people. End quote. Um, so some politicians in the U.S. have also criticized President Biden's decision, including Representative Thomas Massey, Republican from Kentucky, who has consistently voted against U.S. involvement in the Ukraine proxy war. He said this is grounds for the impeachment of President Biden. He wrote on X, quote, by authorizing long range missile strikes inside Russia, Biden is committing an unconstitutional act of war that endangers the lives of all U.S. citizens. This is an impeachable offense, but the reality is he's an emasculated puppet of a deep state, end quote. So also, I think I mentioned this yesterday, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, said that Biden's decision was an attempt to start World War III before his father entered office. He wrote on X, quote, the military industrial complex seems to want to make sure they get World War III going before my father has a chance to create peace and save lives. Gotta lock in those trillions. Life be damned. Imbeciles, end quote. There's a lot of exclamation points in there that I probably didn't carry across. But so, you know, we try to, uh, we're trying to figure out what Trump's foreign policy is really going to look like. Um, and, but he did campaign on ending the war, on ending the proxy war in Ukraine. Um, there's some concerning signs with Marco Rubio and Mike Waltz being involved, but to you know the ordinary voter you know you look at the two people on stage who are running for president you have Trump saying he's going to end the war Kamala Harris saying that she's going to continue it so and i and i saw a lot of people say that this was one of the reasons why they voted for Trump was cuz he said he would end the war so Trump won uh, basically a landslide victory against Harris Yet, in response to that, to the American voter choosing to end this war, the Biden administration is trying to escalate it as much as possible before they're on their way out. They're trying to ship all as many weapons as they possibly can. And now they're, they're going ahead with this. They're going to send, they lifted the ban on sending contractors to Ukraine. So this is just a very dangerous time, these next uh, two, two months. <clears throat> all right, so the next one here, getting into... Uh, the violence in Gaza. Israel kills 76 Palestinians in Gaza over 24 hours. So Gaza's health ministry said Monday that Israeli attacks killed at least 76 Palestinians and wounded 158 more in the previous 24-hour period as Israeli strikes continue to pound targets across the Strip. Strikes on Monday included an attack on Beit Lahia, a city in northern Gaza that's been under a complete siege since early October as part of an ethnic cleansing campaign. According to the Palestinian news agency Wafa, the Israeli strike in Beit Lahia killed at least 17 civilians. The strike was near the Kamal Adwan Hospital, which also came under attack. According to Al Jazeera, people inside the hospital were injured by shrapnel when Israeli forces shelled the entrance. So that hospital has come under a lot of Israeli attacks. In Gaza City, an Israeli airstrike hit a house, killing at least five Palestinians and injuring others. Israeli forces also targeted a house in Jabalia, killing one woman and injuring her family members. This picture I have in here is pretty rough. It's a child, very small child, looks like he could be four or five years old, uh, injured by one of these Israeli airstrikes being treated in the hospital. Israeli attacks were also reported in central and southern Gaza near the southern city of Rafah. An Israeli drone targeted a group of Palestinians, killing at least one. The Israeli military also bombed the Nusrat refugee camp in central Gaza, killing at least four. The health ministry said the latest violence brought its death toll to 43,922 and the number of wounded to 103,898. The figures do not account for Palestinians missing and presumed dead to be under the rubble, which was previously estimated to be over one over 10,000. And that was a while ago. And think about how many airstrikes there have been since then. Um, and the number I always cite, the group of American healthcare workers who sent that open letter to President Biden in October, they said they believed at least 118,000 Palestinians have been killed, both by military action and the siege starvation 
um, and I interviewed the doctor who led that letter, Dr. Faroz Sidwa, and he said that's the bare minimum estimate they came up with um, from looking at the data. Uh, so then that's over 5% of Gaza's population. So the slaughter continues in Gaza. The next one here, the UN says nearly 100 aid trucks in Gaza lost to looters. So the UN's Palestinian Relief Agency, UNRWA, said Monday that nearly 100 aid trucks that entered Gaza over the weekend were lost to armed looters. UNRWA said that at least 98 trucks of a 109-truck convoy were, were lost. The convoy was attacked after entering southern Gaza from Israel through the Karim Shalom border crossing. UNRWA said that the convoy was initially scheduled to enter Gaza on Sunday, but the Israeli military ordered it to leave a day early at, at, short, notice, at short notice via an alternate, unfamiliar route. And this comes after there was a report in Haaretz just last week that said Israel was intentionally allowing armed gangs in Gaza to loot aid trucks and extort drivers for protection money. The report said that in some cases, the last remnants of Gaza's police force tried to take action against the looters, but they were attacked by Israeli troops. Um, so this is saying that they're allowing them to do this, the Israeli forces. And then the Washington Post had another report on this that just came out that was just published that said these gangs operate freely in Israeli controlled uh, areas. So they are allowing this to happen. And this context, I mean, I read a lot of different, a lot of coverage of these aid trucks being looted and the context of Israel allowing the gangs to loot the trucks, which seems to be very important context, was not included in in really anything except that Washington Post report that I saw. They had kind of a new, some new uh, information about it. So, and Israel has systematically targeted Gaza's, Gaza's police force throughout the past year. The Israeli military justifies its attacks on the police force by pointing to Hamas's control over it. Uh, but the lack of police has made securing aid for starving Palestinians much more difficult and impossible in some areas. I mean, this goes to show if they can get the aid up to these levels that the U.S. wants. Well, I shouldn't even say that the U.S. wants. That the U.S. pretends that they want, you know, 350 trucks a day, which isn't even what the aid organizations say that they need 500 a day. But they haven't even gotten close to that 350. Even if they did, I mean, there's no mech there's no internal you know, security to, to secure these trucks. Um, but there was, it does look like some action was taken against these looters uh, by Hamas. Gaza's interior ministry said Monday that it had confronted gangs responsible for looting aid. The ministry said, quote, more than 20 members of gangs involved in stealing aid trucks were killed in a security operation carried out by security forces in cooperation with tribal committees. Today's security operation will not be the last. The phenomenon of truck thefts has severely impacted society and led to signs of famine in South Gaza, end quote. So I guess the Israeli military didn't intervene on the side of the gangs in that case. So, um, and this comes, you know, there's shortages across Gaza, but in the north, they're enforcing this total blockade on the three cities of Beit Lahia, Beit Hanun, and Jabalia, not allowing any aid to enter those areas, but... The shortages are really bad uh, across Gaza. All right, so the next one here, Bernie Sanders pushes to block U.S. arms sale to Israel. This article is from Al Jazeera. So the United States Senate will vote later this week on bills to block a $20 billion arms deal with Israel, an effort advocates say will set a precedent in congressional efforts to halt weapon transfers to the U.S. ally. Senator Bernie Sanders introduced the measure known as Joint Resolutions of Disapproval in September and announced on November 13th that he will bring them to the Senate floor for a vote this week. The effort is unlikely to pass in the mostly pro-Israel chamber. I mean, it, it's not unlikely to pass. There's virtually no chance that it's going to pass. But it has been garnering support from rights groups and a growing number of Democratic lawmakers. And I still think this is important because it's going to... Um, the vote, it, it, there's going to be a record. Every senator is going to have to go on record and say, yes, I want to keep sending weapons to Israel, even though they're committing all these war crimes and genocide and ethnic cleansing, um, which, you know, of course, they'll deny. But I, I think it's good to show the record. Um, 
and uh, and it's a, also a message to Biden. I don't know. It's just good, I think, for this vote to happen. And of course, we could tell our senators to vote vote in favor of it, of blocking the sales. I saw something from Drop Site News that a total of six senators have indicated that they will vote for this. Um, so you know, we'll make sure when they have the vote to have their names and everything. But uh, I think uh, just a, a way again to put on record to to get a count. Rand Paul has a history of voting against arms sales. But Rand Paul has not been good on on Israel, especially over this past year. My guess is that he would probably not not vote or vote present, um, or maybe even vote against it. I don't know. We'll see what what he does. But you know, if this went up in the House, I would expect Thomas Massey to vote for it, to vote for ending the sales. But I I, I don't expect Ron Rand Paul to do it. Did I say Ron Paul? I meant to say Rand Paul. Ron Paul would would do it. <laughs> Uh, all right, so the next one here, Israel attacks religious site in central Beirut. This article is from Jason Ditz. Israel is continuing to increase airstrikes against various neighborhoods of the Lebanese capital city of Beirut. On Monday, those strikes centered on the densely populated working class quarter of Zoa al blat The attack hit near al-Zara Husseini, a Shiite religious site. The attack occurred late in the afternoon, and the Lebanese health ministry puts the current toll at five killed and 24 injured. The attack hit a residential apartment building between the Husseina, Hussein Ia, causing substantial damage to the immediate area. Rescue efforts are still underway. The Zokak al Blat quarter, which is home to multiple embassies, has taken in a large number of displaced civilians from southern and eastern Lebanon, fleeing their homes after Israel imposed evacuation orders. Israel continues to issue such orders over an ever-increasing area since its invasion. Uh, Israel has yet to comment on these strikes in central Beirut, and there's no indication what on what or who was the actual uh, target. Israel has recently attacked a number of sites housing displaced civilians or refugees. Um, and the targeted area was not in a designation designated evacuation zone, um, but Israel did not issue any warnings prior to the strike. And of course, we've seen that all over Lebanon now, you know, they tell people to evacuate and they bomb the areas that they evacuate to. All right, so the next one here, Netanyahu says that even if there's a ceasefire in Lebanon, Israel will continue to operate against Hezbollah. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Monday that even if there is a ceasefire deal reached in Lebanon, Israel will still operate militarily against Hezbollah. So he says even if there's a ceasefire, there won't be a ceasefire. <laughs> it's essentially what it sounds like he said. Uh, he said, quote, the most important thing is not the deal that will be laid on paper. We will be forced to ensure our security in the north of Israel and to systematically carry out operations against Hezbollah's attacks, even after a ceasefire, end quote. Netanyahu's comments reflect Israel's demands for a ceasefire in Lebanon. Israel wants Hezbollah to withdraw from southern Lebanon to areas north of the Litani River and wants its military to have freedom of action in southern Lebanon so it can enforce the deal. And that's a non-starter for Hezbollah and the Lebanese government. A few weeks ago, Israeli media reported on a leaked U.S.-drafted proposal for a Lebanon ceasefire that included Israel's conditions. Uh, the U.S. recently submitted a new ceasefire proposal to Lebanon, which the Lebanese government said that it received positively. So that's a sign that this new U.S. proposal does not include this demand for Israeli freedom of action. Yet, what is Netanyahu doing? He's going out publicly and, and making clear that this is still one of his demands. Um so Lebanon's Prime Minister, Najiv Makadi said on Monday that most issues were, re re were resolved with this latest U.S. draft proposal, but there were some unclear points that required clarification from Amos Hochstein, who President Biden has appointed as an, envo as an envoy for Lebanon ceasefire talks. So Hochstein is expected to be, I think he's already in Beirut, um, and, you know, he's the one... There was that report from Politico after Israel's big escalation in Lebanon, after the pager and beeper attacks, and uh, then when they really ramped up the bombing. The U.S. before, basically before Israel killed Nasrallah, the U.S. was claiming that they wanted a ceasefire. Then after that, they changed their tune. Um, 
But then this report from Politico came out and said Hochstein and Brett McGurk, who's Biden's Middle East official on the Security Council, National Security Council, were encouraging, privately encouraging Israel to escalate. So that's Hochstein. So I certainly wouldn't trust him in ceasefire negotiations. He's also an Israeli. He was born in Israel and is an IDF veteran. Um, but anyway, uh, so later on Monday, so I wrote this and then there was a report from Reuters that came out and some Lebanese officials said that both the Lebanon government and Hezbollah have now accepted this U.S. draft ceasefire proposal. Still, they said there's some details they want to work out. Um, so, you know, hopefully some sort of deal is, is reached here because, I mean, the violence in Lebanon has just been, uh, it seems like it's been increasing recently. I'm skeptical. And I mean, this is just seems like a repeat of what, Netanyahu did during the negotiations with Hamas. Um, you know, there would be these reports that, oh, they're making progress. They agreed on this and that. But then Netanyahu goes out and makes these demands saying, we're not going to agree to a permanent ceasefire. Uh, we're going to keep the Philadelphia corridor. Um, there was another thing he like inserted in there and he would just go out and say these things publicly. And this is kind of a similar uh, thing that seems to be happening here. Um, but we'll see. Hopefully there's some progress and there's a ceasefire. All right. So the next one here, uh, the U.S. and the Philippines sign a new military pact. So on Monday, the U.S. and the Philippines took steps to boost their military alliance by signing a new intelligence and weapons technology sharing agreement and starting the construction of a new joint command center in the Philippines. So U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin signed the intelligence deal known as the General Security of Military Information Agreement with his Philippine counterpart, the Philippine um, Defense Minister. And Austin did, a, did this while he was visiting Manila. He's on a little tour of the region. Uh, the Philippine Defense Minister said that the agreement will, quote, allow the Philippines to access higher capabilities and big-ticket items from the United States, end quote. Details of the agreement were not released, but unnamed Philippine officials told the AP that it would allow the U.S. to provide the Philippines with higher level intelligence and more sophisticated weapons, including missile systems. It will also give the Philippine military access to U.S. drone and surveillance data. Um, so Austin and the Philippine defense minister also attended a groundbreaking ceremony for a new combined coordination center at Camp Aguinaldo, the headquarters of the Philippine military. Austin said at the cemetery, quote, this center will enable real-time information sharing for a common operating picture, and it will help boost interoperability for many years to come. It will be a place where our forces can work side by side to respond to regional challenges, end quote. So the U.S. has been expanding its military footprint in the Philippines and increasing ties with Manila as part of its plans for a future conflict with China. And the U.S. is also strongly backing the Philippines in its maritime dispute with China in the South China Sea, which has become a potential flashpoint for a war between the U.S. and China because you have these incidents, these collisions, these, these standoffs between Chinese and Philippine boats. And whenever this happens, the U.S. comes out and says that the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty applies to attacks on Philippine boats in the South China Sea, basically saying if this thing turns hot, if it turns into a shooting war, we're going to intervene uh, on the side of the Philippines against China. So it's, a, it's definitely a very dangerous part uh, of the world right now, and this is uh, the U.S. is really ramping up support for the Philippines, and we are certainly going to see this stuff continue under the next uh, Trump administration. All right, so the next one here, Taiwan plans to spend $2.2 billion on U.S. weapons next year. This article is from the South China Morning Post. So there's all this talk about Trump, you know, has been saying that Taiwan's got to pay more for defense, got to pay more for their military. Um, so they have some plans here um, about spending. Taiwan will spend um, 70 point, well, it's $70.6 billion. Taiwan dollars, uh, I'm not sure what their currency is called, which uh, is uh, $2.2 billion, $2.2 billion US dollars. Um, and they're planning to spend that on weapons from the, the US next year. Um, the island's defense ministry said that Taipei has signed contracts with the United States for 21 procurement projects. 
um, with final payments scheduled to be made in 2031. Um, so next year's uh, budget will be spent on weapon systems, including portable short range air defense missiles and radar system upgrades. A recent proposal submitted to Taiwan's legislature for reviewed highlight uh, Taiwan's legislature for review highlighted those purchases, including Abrams tanks, um, F-16 fighter jets, HIMARS rocket systems, and Harpoon land-based missile systems. They just got their first shipment of HIMARS uh, recently, so um, I think we'll probably see a lot of arm sales for Taiwan approved in the next in the next year, if, if not before the end of this year, we might see some too. All right, so the next one here, the last story, Kim Jong-un calls for limitless nuclear buildup. So this article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un delivered a fiery speech where he stressed the importance of accelerating the country's nuclear weapons program in response to Western threats. In the address to the North Korean army on Friday, Kim said, quote, the United States has already converted its alliance with South Korea into a nuclear-based one and created an Asian NATO in haste by cementing its military ties with Japan and South Korea. End quote. The North Korean leader stressed that nu U.S. nuclear deployments to the region, joint war games with South Korea and Japan, and building military blocks aimed at Pyongyang are all intolerable to North Korea. Um, he said, quote, long ago, the line of building up our nuclear forces became an irreversible policy. So re what remains to be done now is for these forces to get more fully ready for action so that they can carry out the mission of the Turing War and the second mission at any moment. We will build up our nation's self-defense forces, the pivot of which is its nuclear capability, limitlessly and endlessly without satisfaction, end quote. Uh, he also said that... Uh, his position on, on the U S and, and this kind of alliance building that is happening. Um, uh, and, and kind of just went after, uh, U S foreign policy in general. He said, quote, by sustaining their military assistance to Ukraine and Israel, this aggravates the international security system, stoking fears of a third world war End quote. This is something I hope Trump goes back to, you know, he met with Kim, um, a few times and, uh, he went into the DMZ and, and shook his hand, um, you know, no concrete deals came out of it, but ten tension certainly de-escalated. At the time, you had a South Korean president who was in favor, uh, Moon Jae-in, who was in favor of reunification. So he was all about it. Now the current president, Yoon, is a hawk on North Korea. So that could that could affect things. But um, and then, um, but I do think this is something Trump would probably try to pursue again. Though the thing I'm worried about is that the China Hawks in his administration might try to convince him, hey, you know, all these deployments, these war games in South Korea, you know, look, look, that's, that's, you know, it's really about China. It's really about flexing uh, muscles to China. I think that is, that is a big part of what's happened over the past few years. All right. So that is it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. One from Medea Benjamin and Nicholas J.S. Davies. Eight reasons why Marco Rubio would be a disastrous Secretary of State. One from Ron Paul. If Trump did not send Musk to talk with the Iranians, he should. One from Stephen Wertheim. The Cheney-loving Democratic Party needs a reckoning about war. One from Ian Proud. With Putin, Trump's art of the deal is put to the test. Um, and our spotlight is from Renny, Lenny Breutman at his substack, The Cabinet of the Supposedly Anti-War Trump Takes Shape. So please go check all that stuff out. Check out our blog. Um, lots of news stuff uh, in the lower section too. Just lots of stuff. Also go buy Provoked, Scott Horton's new book, available for purchase on Amazon, How Washington Started the New Cold War with Russia and the Catastrophe in Ukraine. I'll be reminding you about this quite a bit. I'll talk about it a little more as I am working my way through it, but I, you know, it's it's great. It's in typical Scott Horton style where it's just packed full of information, completely um, debunking all these narratives. You know, it's in the title, Provoked. <laughs> so please uh, go go purchase a copy of that. Um, it's the number one bestseller in War and Peace. I saw it was number one in, in Russian history on Amazon. So let's keep, keep buying it, keep those numbers going up. Uh, so that is it. I will, uh, you could always support this show by sharing it, like subscribe on YouTube or rumble or odyssey, wherever you prefer to watch 
If you listen to the podcast, you could always leave a rating or a review, depending on where you listen. Um, follow me on X, follow antiwar.com there, and follow antiwar.com on Instagram. The posts are really looking nice over there. Um, and the algorithm kind of works against us there uh, quite a bit. So always good to have new followers. Uh, that is it for me for today. I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening. <laughs>